I'd like to thank everyone for joining the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University for our webinar series, Impact Insights. We are so pleased to have you join us as we discuss how businesses can navigate the changing landscape as a result of the COVID pandemic. We are dedicated to bringing you valuable insights and doing our part to create a stronger Los Angeles and beyond. This series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good for the Los Angeles and global community. So just a few items in terms of our webinar and community guidelines. Um, if not already, all your, um, your Zoom should be set to speaker view. Please do type in your questions in the Q&A window and chat window and we'll be monitoring those. Um, these questions will be moderated after the presentation. Um, we will also leave time for interactive Q&A, um, so please do raise your hand and we will unmute you so you can talk directly to our speakers. And as a friendly reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. So we are thrilled to have um, our distinguished professor David Stewart and Derek Day, managing partner um, of the Blake Project to speak with us today. Uh, Professor Stewart has conducted extensive research on marketing strategy, market analysis, consumer information search and decision process, public policy issues related to marketing, just to name a few. In short, Professor Stewart is a true marketing expert and a thought leader in his field. We're also happy to have Mr. Derek Day uh, join the conversation as he has extensive experience helping organizations release their full potential through various marketing strategies such as branding, advertising, sales, and public relations. Currently, he leads the Blick Project and has also held leadership roles at Saatchi & Saatchi, a global advertising agency leader. Professor Stewart and Mr. Day will be talking to us today how businesses can maximize intangible assets, a topic I believe businesses should be thinking about in today's changing business landscape. So without further ado, uh, Professor Stewart and Mr. Day. So gentlemen, please don't forget to unmute yourselves and yep. the floor is yours. Well, nice to be here. Um, I know that uh, David's gonna kick us off here, but uh, we're gonna be talking about intangible assets which I'm encouraging everyone to kind of lean in and, and listen closely because I think it's gonna be a discussion that you're not used to hearing um, about um, building, uh, building brands. Uh, some financial dimensions, we'll be talking about a few different things, but David's gonna kick us off. Delighted, but Nola, I have to ask you to enable my screen sharing. No, I'm still not able to share my screen. Okay, there we go. Technology is wonderful when it works. Um, Indeed. I'm delighted to be here Sorry. this morning. Um, and I wanna share with you some thoughts um, about the role of intangible assets. Um, intangible assets uh, tend to be rather invisible. Um, when I talk about intangible assets, what I mean are assets that are used in the operation of a business, but they really have no physical substance. Um, but as I will share with you as we go through the presentation, for most businesses, they represent the majority of, of assets. They represent the primary way in which firms make money. Now, just as a way of level setting here, let me simply say that, that assets in general, whether intangible or intangible, are ways to make money. And I, I tell my students that, that even tangible assets, say a building, are not really assets if you don't use them to make money. Uh, in fact, a vacant building is not an asset, it's a liability. But we're going to be talking about intangible assets those types of assets that you can't really hold in your hand. And there's a long list. I have some examples here. Certainly brands uh, fall in that category. And we'll, we'll talk in detail, Derek will talk in detail about brands uh, toward the end of the presentation. But customer lists, 
I mean, imagine the value of Amazon's customer list and, and all they know about their customers. Customer loyalty, patents, copyrights, business processes, uh, basic knowledge. Um, knowledge that the organization possesses or, or knowledge that, that individual employees possess. Customer contracts, franchisees, franchises, and licenses, the, the list gets quite long. Now, I'd, I'd like to use this cartoon as a way of illustrating what we're talking about. Um, you know, cavemen men have killed um, a large mammoth here. Uh, they have found the spot where they can do the damage. Uh, and one says to the other, we should write that spot down. Uh, that's an example of an intangible asset. It's a piece of knowledge. And indeed, one of the things I would suggest to you is as you think about your business, you might think about all of the intangible assets that exist, including, for example, your individual employees. What knowledge do they possess? And what's the value of that knowledge? What relationships are they involved in? And what is the value to your organization? In recent years, there's been a lot of focus on what, what the value of intangible assets are as a portion of the total business. Um, and uh, Ocean Tomo, a consulting firm, a few years ago now, actually did an analysis of the value of intangible assets in the S&P 500. And what they found was that as of 2015, and they've since replicated this, and the numbers are very similar, almost 90% of the value of the S&P 500 was in intangible assets. And they compared that to what the value of intangible assets were in 1975, when it was only about 17%, a little less than 20%. Now, I will qualify that by saying, I think part of this reflects the fact that in 1975, we really didn't have as much of an appreciation for the intangible assets that did exist. But clearly today, we know that intangible assets are, are, are a major source of wealth. Here's another example um, of what's happened to um, the, the relative value of tangible versus intangible assets. Um, again, similar trend, remarkable increase in uh, what has transpired. Um, here's an international dimension. This is uh, some research from uh, the UK, um, perhaps not as much uh, identified as being uh, intangible assets, but still a very sizable percentage of UK assets uh, that are intangible. Um, and indeed, uh, risk analysis has suggested that 50% of companies cite risk to their intangible assets and specifically brand as, as, their, as their top risk. And indeed, we've seen within the past year, a, a number of firms, very big successful firms, take substantial write downs uh, on the value of their intangible assets. We've seen that with uh, Kraft Heinz, we've seen that with Procter and Gamble's uh, uh, battery division. Um, and, and what that simply represents is growing recognition of the importance of one realizing you have intangible assets and secondly, managing them well. Um, this is very hard for you to see, but I, I pointed out because this may be a place you want to go and look. Um, it's, uh, it's a really nice summary of the, the, the relative value of firms in terms of the uh, intangible versus tangible assets. Um, as, as one illustration, if you were to go and look at the balance sheet of Amazon, you would see that the assets that are listed for Amazon total roughly $50 billion. But we know that the market cap of Amazon is roughly a billion dollars, uh, roughly a trillion dollars. So what, what that means is that what's on the balance sheet is only about 5% of the value of the company. Um, so we're really talking about huge amounts of value or wealth that is to some extent invisible. It's certainly invisible with respect to all of the financial reporting that's that's now done. By the way, that's not been lost on uh, some of our policymakers. 
Um, there, there have been recent serious proposals in Congress to uh, start amateurizing intangible assets, including brands, uh, and I might add, um, training and development of employees. Now those proposals have not yet got out of committee, uh, but they, they, they are serious proposals. Um, intangible assets matter for a variety of reasons. Uh, PwC has done a great deal of research uh, on this topic, and um, they agree that 80% or more of many companies' values are in intangible assets. Uh, and they're important because one, they provide barriers to entry. Uh, if you have a brand, um, no one else can legally use that brand. And brands are very, very powerful um, as, as um, determinants of consumer choice. Uh, when Coca-Cola tried to kill Old Coke, uh, there were little, literally riots uh, in the street. Um, and so they had, had to bring it back. I mean, that's an example of loyalty in, in a barrier to entry. They certainly provide a way of differentiating products, e even commodities. Um, they provide a, you know, a, a very stable and profitable earning stream. Um, they, they certainly have very long lives. Um, many of the leading brands today, at least among consumer products, uh, were leading brands 80, 100 years ago. And they certainly provide international recognition. So these are, these are assets that really deserve attention. They really re deserve uh, management focusing on, first of all, what they are, how they're being used, and, and how they might be further leveraged. And yes, brands are a major source of, of intangible assets, but there are many, many other forms of, of intangible assets. Um, knowledge, um, business processes, much, much of the value of Amazon uh, resides in, in the business processes that they have created, um, it, but also includes things like employee engagement, collaboration, relationships, partnerships. So there's a wide array of things that we deal with in the normal course of business that actually have considerable value. Uh, and when we, when we lose those things, we, we often realize the value that we have lost. There are really four components of intangibles. Um, people, um, much of the intangible value resides in, in people's knowledge, their, their uh, emotions, uh, their, uh, their way of thinking, their way of behaving. Uh, but it also involves relationships. Uh, relationships can be very powerful uh, in, in sales management. Uh, we often talk about the fact that it's, it's really important to assure that the organization owns the customer relationship rather than the individual salesperson. Uh, because if the individual salesperson owns the relationship, and leaves the organization, they've taken value with them. There are also structural and organizational elements uh, of, of intangible assets. Uh, part of what creates value for a firm like Walmart is that they have created an extraordinary distribution structure and distribution organization. In fact, a whole culture around low cost. Uh, it's very difficult for any other firm to replicate. Uh, and that's an intangible asset. And, and finally, just the way a firm makes money, its business model is really an intangible asset. Indeed, Amazon really has not invented, innovated uh, any real tangible assets, but what they have done is they've created a, a, a new business model uh, that has enormous value. There's some implications of this I might just quickly point out. First of all, there's the opportunity for rising return on investment because um, intangible assets have the potential to be highly scalable. Uh, if, you have a, if you have a brand, um, it, it's well established, you can uh, launch that brand into, into other markets. You can extend the brand into other products. Uh, indeed. Procter & Gamble is a good example. 
They took a toothpaste crest and have now uh, turned it into a brand that's an umbrella for a whole portfolio of dental care products. Um, but we're also seeing greater separation of winners and losers across industries, people um, within industries, uh, because once you have a very powerful intangible asset and you leverage it well, um, it becomes very difficult for others to, to replicate. Um, but this also suggests that there's a need for standards for valuation and accountability. And currently, when we talk about intangible assets, we're in the world of the wild, wild west. Um, the accounting profession has, has, has really not, not wanted to step up and, and, and deal with the, the really messy issues associated with valuing intangible assets. Um, although that's beginning to change, and I'll share with you some, some standards in just a moment. Um, but a final implication is that there's a real need to pay attention to these assets and to actively manage them. Um, I was in a telephone call this morning uh, with some folks, and, and Disney is now reporting uh, the value, the future cash flows of, of their characters. Um, and that they're, they're actively managing those. And indeed, they paid several billion dollars for Marvel, uh, which basically bought simply a catalog of potential characters for future movies, uh, basically a catalog for generating future cash flows. Um, but if you're going to play in the world of intangible assets, you, you must be prepared to, to, to actively manage them and to think about how you're going to leverage them. We are beginning to see some effort at creating standards around uh, evaluating and valuing intangible assets. Uh, ISO, if you're an engineer, you, you're familiar with ISO, has, has recently uh, approved a set of standards around brand evaluation. Uh, I would encourage you to, to go view them. This is a schematic of, of, of the standards. They're about 50 pages and you, you could, go online to ISO TC, that stands for Technical Committee 289, and see the, the standards that have been suggested. ISO also has a set of standards that they have developed for, for putting a value on intangible assets. Uh, they, they suggest several potential approaches, uh, as well as the guidelines for, for actually reporting uh, on the value of those those assets. Uh, again, I would encourage you to become familiar with these if you're if these guidelines. If if you're not, uh, I think they will be finding their way into regulatory practice and accounting practice in the in the not distant future. So finally, there's the issue of, of managing intangible assets. Um, the first thing an organization needs to do is just inventory the assets. What intangible assets does the firm possess? That might be brands, it might be people, it might be the knowledge that your employees have, it could be relationships, whether the, with individual customers, with suppliers or others. Um, and, and then how, how should you best define those assets uh, to, to manage them well? Um, if, it's, if it's a relationship, how do you define that relationship? Uh, if it's knowledge, how do you how do you define that knowledge? Um, and so many firms have not even done the most basic inventory of their intangible assets. Um, they routinely do an inventory of tangible assets, but inventory of intangible assets is rare. Once you've done the inventory, uh, you can assess the value, and you might also assess the vulnerability uh, of of those assets. And then finally, you can begin to think about how to actively manage those assets for optimal return. Um, we could talk about any number of, of intangible assets, uh, but we're going to use brands as an exemplar. Um, perhaps there's been more thought given to, to, to brands and things related to brands as, as, as manageable intangible assets than, than some of the other intangible assets. And, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to Derek.
Thank you, Professor. Uh, I'll gladly take the baton here and bring people closer into uh, intangible assets uh, through the lens of brand. And a little bit more context here. Um, so I'm coming from the perspective of a brand consultant working in the field, uh, helping uh, organizations release their full potential through brand. Um, and so the next couple slides, uh, I intend to bring you closer um, uh, to this topic through that lens. Uh, and as uh, Professor Stewart set this up, uh, you really need to begin by doing an inventory. You, uh, as Peter Drucker famously said, you know, you can't um, uh, measure what, you can't manage what you don't measure. Uh, well, in this sense, uh, a brand audit is indeed uh, a sense of measurement. Um, and just a few of the requirements though, and actually, actually I'm just, I'm thinking that the next slide will get deeper into that, but uh, kind of thinking about assets and putting a fine point of what uh, Professor Stewart um, just said is let's take a look at what, what assets are. Um, a brand in the sense of a brand. So it must be made tangible. A brand must uh, be something identifiable uh, to offer. Um, it's a product or service must have value. And some of these will seem quite obvious, uh, but it's really important as um, my part of this uh, conversation moves forward uh, that, that you have this context. There also must be a distinctive and viable business model. Um, so th this is a requirement requirement of brands. If uh, if you don't have um, a, a successful model, it's not going to get um, it's not going to be able to meet demand in the marketplace. A uh, brand also must differentiate itself from from other offerings. If it doesn't, it's uh, it's simply a commodity and it doesn't mean anything. And differentiation is definitely uh, the core of the work of a brand consultant as you're trying to identify unique value that you can own in someone's mind. Uh, a brand also must be visible uh, to the people that it matters to. Um, if uh, you don't have that awareness, um, there's not going to be much action for your brand. Uh, and a brand must engage with uh, uh, people it seeks to work with. So there has to be an engagement uh, factor. And, and, and that's another characteristic of brands that work as assets. And uh, in this list, there's nine here. Um, the next one is a brand exists to earn margin beyond the going market rate. Uh, you have to, uh, to, um, to actually get out in the marketplace and, and, uh, and, be, and represent value. Uh, it also must create expectations. Uh, expectations, they, they underpin the promises a brand makes. And you've probably heard in the definition of a brand that a brand is a promise. Um, that's one accepted definition of a brand. Uh, mine is, it's the, the sum of all experiences a customer has with you, which of course sounds quite intangible. Um, it also, uh, brands must also capture who they are through a distinctive identity. Uh, so all those customer touch points um, uh, for a brand to be an asset, they, they have to um, be communicating what's special about you. And a lot of that times that happens, uh, or one of the ways that happens is through identity. And a brand must offer experiences around the goods or services it offers. That's where those experiences uh, generate trust, connection, and distinction. And uh, Professor, I'll ask you um, to advance for me. So here's uh, what I teased a little bit earlier um, about brand audits. And you really have to understand the health of your brand. If you're going to build a brand in the marketplace, first it needs to be managed. And if it's gonna be managed well, you're going to do things to make sure that you understand the health of that brand. Um, now, the value of a brand audit is, it's not in the data collected, but the action taken as a result of the insights gained from that audit. Um, and and I, I put these slides together just like uh, the professor did um, for those that will get this as a, a take home PDF. Um, so you'll actually have this to, to hold on to rather than just a few, few bullets and, and for you to decide what they mean. 
Um, so I'm, forgive me it's a little, if it's a little dense. But a comprehensive brand audit uh, will often reveal new growth opportunities for brands, new ways to help you resonate, which is even uh, more important in our, our COVID-driven uh, world that we're in, where people are really deciding what matters to them and uh, what doesn't matter to them. And uh, to state the obvious, things that don't matter are, are falling out of the lives of uh, consumers. Um, so what's it take, um, uh, or what are you thinking about when you're going into a brand audit? And uh, before I get into that, I, I should say that oftentimes in, in uh, brand strategy work, you're, you're starting with some kind of research component uh, because you want to be in what we like to say, uh, in possession of the truth. What's the private voice in the consumer's mind telling themselves. We're trying to tap into that so we can understand them better and uh, align our offerings uh, with uh, what matters uh, to them um, most. So a brand audit is part of that work. Uh, and we look at a lot of different things. It's quite a 360 view. Um, and, and it may surprise you that external partners and customers, well, maybe not the customers, but external partners, we take a look at. So what's happening uh, with channel partners, the reps, the strategic suppliers? Um, what is, um, uh, how are uh, using social media tools is very effective to see how they're even communicating about your brand. Uh, so that's very, uh, a very um, obvious but important component. Internal stakeholders, what are, what's happening within the organization and uh, how are those internal stakeholders perceiving what this brand's value is all about? What meaning it's representing in the marketplace? Um, for a long time, uh, many folks really thought about building brands as an external activity. Uh, but in the past 15 or 20 years or so, we've learned that brands are built from the inside out. So you really have to get it right on the inside before you could get it right on the outside. Um, and of course, uh, competitors. You need to take a look at your competitors. Um, the competition, it's important to keep an eye on the competition. What are they doing? What can we learn from them? Um, but it's also important to know that um, strategy is not about the competition, it's about the customer. Um, you're trying to create value for the customer. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not all about what your competitor is doing. And brand positioning, um, what, what does your brand promise and is it still relevant? You know, over time, uh, strategically, brands have often have to change the promise they're making um, because it, it doesn't matter as much uh, the, the first time they made it. That's how you stay relevant. Um, and the, of course, the paradox of brands is you have to change to stay consistent. And brand identity, um, do customers know what your brand stands for? Um, and a brand audit really gives us a clear view of, um, of just how well uh, you're, resident, you're resonating uh, through your brand identity. And brand equities, it's critical to gain a quantifiable insight on important metrics like brand awareness, purchase behaviors, attitudes, values, market share. There's a lot to think about in brand audits. And um, it's... Uh, a little tedious, um, but the insights are well worth the work. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. And here, uh, continue, uh, continuing here, um, I think it's one more. Yep. A couple more things to look at, uh, your brand architecture. So brand architecture is essentially, it's been described in a couple different ways, but you can look at it as a family of brands, a portfolio of brands. And when you're um, looking at brand architecture through uh, the lens of a brand audit, you've got to check things like, what is the relationship between our brands and the portfolio to the master brand and, and does that matter? Um, an example of that and when it matters would be um, a few years back when um, InBev acquired Anheuser-Busch. Um, and then subsequently, uh, microbrewery brands were uh, acquired along the way. Uh, now there are 
there are target customers uh, of microbrewery brands that are that are enjoying these beers, and they're really not. They really don't want to know that uh, uh, Anheuser Busch is behind them. There's um, uh, there there's a need that they have that's being met that they're drinking this independent small batch beer uh, brand. And so you've got to consider what are those relationships and brand architecture and is it working for us or is it working against us? Um, communications and messaging, that's also part of uh, a brand audit. Um, are we being consistent? And not just how things look visually, but verbally. Are we talking about this brand and its value in a consistent way? Um, that's really key because the consistency is what builds trust um, in all relationships. Um, and so, uh, and then this last point here is budgeting and resource allocation. Uh, and does your brand receive the resources it needs uh, to grow and prosper? If, if you're going to have uh, a brand, uh, have a brand as an asset, um, this of course needs to be considered. Uh, and appreciate it that you have to invest in in building your brand. Uh, it's not going to do that. It's not going to do that on its own. Um, uh, just a side note for any marketers that that may be joining us today. Uh, uh, there, there's always this tension going in, uh, and and often it's a fight to to get a marketing budget. Uh, and oftentimes um, uh, marketers are coming to me and saying, I. I just can't get the budget we need to do this. Um, marketing's role has been diminished in, in organizations like that. And they ask me what to do. Um, and uh, one of the things that I find out in those conversations is marketers are not very good at marketing marketing. And uh, they're also not good at standing up for themselves in some cases. If you really believe in something, um, you're gonna fight for that idea. Uh, and you're gonna go back and back and back and fight for that idea. Um, so uh, next slide, uh, Professor. So I'm gonna wrap it up here, which I think is a real strong uh, point here in, in, in why build brands and, and the, the strength of, of brands. And there's actually more benefits than, than what I'm gonna share here in this list, um, uh, but, but indeed benefits and intangible assets um, are the drivers, uh, uh, key business drivers, as uh, the professor pointed out at the top of, of our discussion uh, when he mentioned uh, Apple's value uh, or Amazon's value in, in the marketplace. Um, so here are some of the high notes of what brands do for you when you invest in them. Uh, they're revenue generators, increasing customer loyalty, attracting new customers, decreasing price sensitivity. Brands do that for you. Uh, cost efficiency enhancer. So an in-demand brand uh, allows to take uh, the, uh, the company to take advantage of economies of scale. As, as your popular brand uh, sells more, um, you can do that. Uh, a growth facilitator uh, facilitates the introduction and success of its extensions to other markets and other products. And often uh, one of the ways that's done is through brand licensing. Uh, it's a human capital builder. So the best employees, they want to work for those big, strong brands. As, as a matter of fact, and this isn't uh, new news, but um, uh, companies like GE have seen a lot of great talent wanting to work for Apple and Google and Facebook. And they're trying to figure out how to, how to attract um, uh, the, the, the smartest people uh, to come back to them. Um, so the strength of the brand has a lot to do with that. Employee motivator, uh, uh, employees want to protect and, stre and strengthen the brand. They believe in the brand. Um, it's, it, this is interesting too. Uh, it's a second chance provider. Um, customers, they have a willingness to forgive mistakes uh, from strong brands because they trust those brands and they see, and perhaps those brands have taken on human characteristics. Um, and, uh, and there's a higher trust factor. Um, and so uh, the level of forgiveness is, is, is higher for those, those brands. Um, market protector. So uh, touching on what the professor shared earlier, uh, brands can serve as a barrier to entry for future competitors. Uh, alliance fa facilitator, uh, facilitating alliances and desirable and powerful external uh, partners. 
uh, asset builder, uh, which is the, the nature of our talk today, enhancing the company's uh, marketplace value and commanding a premium price. Uh, leverage builder, um, you have more leverage with vendors and retailers if you're a manufacturer, if you happen to have a strong brand. Uh, and lastly, focus builder. Um, and, and, and let me just uh, uh, end on this, that you know, the power of brands lies in focus. And for some organizations, that is uh, easy for them to do because it's, it's in their DNA and their senior leadership team is all about focus. Other organizations are all over the road and I see this and they're tempted to get into places where they don't belong. Um, but if you've thought through your brand strategy, you're going to be able to have a clear compass to help you make decisions. Um, so thank you. Fantastic. Thank you both so much. Um, so I think what we'll do is open it up for questions um, from the audience. So um, like I mentioned earlier, you are welcome to type in your questions in the chat or in the Q&A um, box, or you're also welcome to raise your hand and speak directly to the speakers if you have any questions about the presentation, um, intangible assets. Well, maybe I'll launch because I, I, I question did pop up for me and, and perhaps you guys can, can address well, that. Let me just say uh, that okay. while we used brands as, a, as an illustration, the, the issue and the framework could be applied to any intangible asset, whether it be your employees, whether it be relationships with, with suppliers. Um, and these are all potential sources of value that, that you, firms would do well to, to, to inventory and take, take a very hard look at. Uh, and anybody who's interested in additional information uh, beyond uh, asking for the set of slides, which we're happy to provide, um, I have a book out called Financial Dimensions of Marketing Decisions that get into a little more depth of how one might go around, uh, go about the process of valuing uh, intangible assets and, and actually making a case for resources uh, to, to develop and leverage them. Uh, Derek actually runs a, a website called Branding Strategy Insider uh, that is a source of a lot of really interesting and useful practical information. Um, and uh, we've also provided you with our email address if we don't get to your question today or something occur, occurs to you uh, uh, later and, and you'd like to ask. So, okay, let's go to the questions. Great. So I do have a question um, from Turngu, and I apologize if I said that incorrectly. Um, how can firms evaluate intangible assets and avoid or minimize over-evaluation or under undervaluation of these assets? Well, I think the first thing you, the, the firm needs to do is to have a formal process um, by which uh, one identifies potential intangible assets. Um, if you don't have a formal process, this, the evaluation will never occur. Um, and indeed the ISO standards for evaluation uh, are all about creating a standardized ongoing process. Uh, you, don't, you don't inventory your, your uh, intangible assets once and say we're done because they are ever evolving, ever changing uh, the, the world in which they exist is, is also changing. And so there needs to be a systematic process that includes an owner. Um, who's, who's responsible for intangible assets? Who's responsible for specific intangible assets? Um, and, uh, and then when do you get together to actually talk about those intangible assets? Um, it's probably less important that you put a very precise dollar value on an asset than it is to have a conversation about the existence of the asset and, and how it's being managed and leveraged to generate revenue. And uh, uh, David, let me just add to that, um, um, to the questioner. Uh, one of the companies you cited very early on was Brand Finance, and they specialize in doing brand valuations. Mm -hmm. So that's a really unique uh, or, or very, I should say, specialized um, thing to do in our world. There's, there's really three 
maybe four companies in the world that specialize in, in brand valuation and uh, in helping you understand uh, the, the financial, uh, the value for, uh, through a financial lens. So you may want to look up uh, brand finance. Um, I see another question there, and I don't know, uh, Nola, if you just read these or how. Happy to. Um, I'll just do the follow up and then we'll go into Dale's question from Turngu again. Um, what are some indicators that your brand value is, is losing its strength in a firm's portfolio? Do you want to take that, Dave, and I, then I'll build off it? Yeah, I'll start. I mean, I, I, I think there are a number of things that, that um, are clues. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly think you want to pay attention to, um, to market share. Um, you know, how are you doing relative to competition? Um, I, I, I think you want to pay attention to um, how difficult it is to sell your product. I mean, if you're having to use lots of price discounts um, to sell a product, that's, that's evidence of, of a potential problem. Um, but I also think it's really important in, in, the, in the context of a brand to, to be continuously monitoring what we often call brand, brand, brand health metrics. Things like uh, top of mind awareness. Little simple questions like, you know, if, if, if you were buying today, what, what products, what brands would you consider? And if, you, and if, and if you're not being named uh, among the top two or three by most customers, that's a problem. Um, and these are really simple measures. Um, I, I think the best consultant with respect to brands is your customer. How are you doing? Um, what would you improve? Um, you know, are you going to buy again? Um, I mean, none of this is really rocket science. It's just um, in many organizations, it's, it's not been systematized. Um, and uh, as a result, it's not well attended to. And one of the purposes for this particular presentation was to, to help organizations think about these wonderful sources of value that exist that, that, that are not readily visible, um, you know, unlike a building or a piece of equipment, uh, but in fact are often the primary source of, of, of value that's being created. You know, one other indicator um, to share is a real simple one. Uh, if you're an established brand and people stop talking about you, uh, and I'm not just talking about the press, I'm talking about what's happening on social media. That's an indication that uh, you're, um, you're starting to not matter much. So um, that's, that is especially for established brands that, uh, and of course, um, you know, on a national scale, uh, if, if the press just doesn't care or people just don't care, um, you need to go back and look at the value you're creating because it's probably diminishing. Great, great. Um, so our Dean actually has a question. When so many business schools do the same thing, how might a business school do a better job managing its intangible, intangible assets? Little differentiation if you aren't the top brand. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll start us off on that one, uh, uh, Dean. So I've worked with a couple major universities, and I think one of the biggest problems in the space is, um, and I'm just going to be frank here as a, as a uh, consultant, having been in, in uh, working with leadership teams, is it's what's happening uh, at the top when it comes to differentiation. There's a real fear to try new things. So um, whether it's reimagining um, what your university stands for in the mind. Um, there's a lot of things that have been put in place over, over years and years and years that have now turned, that used to be um, things that pushed your school forward, they've now turned into barriers. Um, and so you have, to, you have to come back and say, you know, do that inventory and, and, what, uh, and, and also go into it with thinking, we're gonna break everything down so we can build it up uh, to make it relevant um, uh, today. Uh, so with differentiation, I think smaller schools have a great opportunity 
because they can, um, they may not see this, but they can take more risks. Uh, they can try things um, that the bigger uh, schools um, uh, cannot. And it's, it's uh, it, you know, anything can be differentiated. Uh, look at water. It wasn't, you know, 30 years ago, someone would have laughed at you if you said you were launching a water brand. Um, and look where we have thousands of water brands now, and some of them have been very, very successful. Um, so differentiation is quite possible, uh, it, more than possible uh, when it comes to universities. And I, I think you, you have to uh, turn your attention to why aren't we uh, unique and different. And, and one other thought on that, parity is important too, because you're building context, right? I mean, it's important that to some degree, I look like a university. Um, so I, that's important. Parity is important in some categories, in, including banks. I have to look a little bit like a bank. So people, you know, I need to see a vault door, those kinds of things. Um, but then you can grow outside uh, of, of those, um, you know, those, those boundaries. Uh, and I think uh, to the other part of your question, I think the professor is probably better at answering that. Um, as far as managing intangible assets within a university? Well, I, and I, I would just add that while, while differentiation is, is important, I think many organizations, including universities, are often reluctant to differentiate because differentiation is not just about who you're going to do business with. It's also about who you're not going to do business with. Um, you know, as soon as you're as soon as you differentiate from a competitor, you've basically said, you know, I'm, I'm going to do something well that, that others don't do, but that may also be something that's not attractive to some part of the market. Um, and, and so you, you have to be prepared to, uh, uh, to make the hard decision that you're not going to do business with certain parts of the market. Uh, Disney does not make, adult films, at least under the, adult, uh, the, the Disney label. Um, it does that quite deliberately because it wants to stand out in, in the area of family entertainment. Um, one could say that's limiting, um, but it's also part of what constitutes their success. So I think it's really about figuring out who, who you really want to focus on. Um, and, and, and I'll put in a plug for LMU. I think LMU has a very powerful point of differentiation um, and uh, we just need to leverage it. Uh, let me add, and, and uh, this, this is an exercise that I, I think would be helpful uh, and it's in the context of this question. But one of the things that we do in brand strategy is an exercise that we call pick an enemy. And an enemy is not your competitor. An enemy is that thing in the marketplace that competes or is in conflict with your purpose. Uh, and an enemy is ideally that thing that's standing in, a way, in the way of your customers that you can join the fray in defeating that enemy. So uh, in that context, and, and, and I'll, I'll use a business example. So Tom Shoes, uh, most of you probably know that brand. Uh, but they uh, introduced a one-for-one -one program where every pair of shoes they sold, um, a child in need would get a pair for free. So the enemy of their brand was, and what that brand decided was unacceptable to them, was that there were children in the world that were barefoot because of poverty. So what is the enemy of your brand? What is it that you're out trying to, and, and that's part of differentiation. There's several different models to go through to, to kind of define that, that point. And I wanna be clear and, and, and say that I also think there's, uh, uh, LMU has a lot of strength. And I know you're nestled in the middle of some schools that are much bigger than yours in this city. Um, but uh, I bet there's even more value uh, that could be unearthed to further differentiate you. Great, thank you for that. Um, if there are any more questions, again, please feel free to type them in the question box or raise your hand and we're happy to unmute you. Um, I do have a question. You know, given the, um, the social movements that are taking place and COVID that's, that's affecting all of our lives, um, what should small businesses focus on based on the four 
um, components of intangibles that you mentioned. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, let me, let me tackle that first of all. Um, first, I think a lot of businesses have made a mistake of pulling back in terms of their marketing and outreach during COVID. I think that's a mistake. Uh, in, in fact, there's real opportunity because if your competitors are all pulling back, um, th they've actually opened the playing field for you and you should really take advantage of that. Uh, so I would, I would look very carefully as a small business at, um, you know, who are your critical customers, the relationship you have with those customers. And I would really work on, on um, paying a lot of attention to them, uh, deepening those relationships. Uh, you know, the, we're all kind of in isolation these days. And so people might just like to hear from you. Um, are you doing well? Um, no, I'm not, no, I'm not ready to buy from you, but I really do appreciate you, uh, you're checking in with me. And when I get ready to buy, I'm going to come see you. Um, so I, I think there's a real opportunity if, if we don't all hunker down and, and, and isolate ourselves. Um, the, the, I think this is an ideal time to realize uh, business opportunities and growth. Yeah, let me re let me reinforce that. Um, you know, if you consider your brand as a friend uh, to its to your customers, um, in the toughest times, would you want that friend to go quiet? Mm -hmm. No, you'd want them to be there. Mm -hmm. They they need you. Um, and and we're not talking about a sales message. We're talking about a relationship uh, message. Um, probably uh, uh, and to, to go a little bit further. Um, and all the way back to 1929 and the Great Depression, um, everyone stopped advertising except for one, and that was P&G. They went all in, and that gave them a, a, an 80-year advantage over everybody else. Everyone pulled back. They went full throttle. So um, people want, uh, they want to hear from people they trust. They want to hear from the brands that are in their life and matter to them. And, you know, over time, brands have really become, uh, we, we've taken, the, or brands have taken the position, uh, a much stronger position than they ever have before. I mean, they're, they're trusted more than uh, institutions. Uh, a lot of institutions that have been in our world for a long, long time, brands have now stepped into the role that they once played. Um, so you're expected to be there for your customer through um, uh, the good times and the bad. Thank you. Thank you for that. Does anyone else have questions that you'd like to type in? Well, I have one more question. <laughs> um, so Derek, you mentioned, you know, changing the brand promise. Do you see a lot more organizations, small and large, changing their brand promise given um, the COVID situation and the various social movements taking place? Yes. Uh, it, it's, uh, so brand promise is, it, it, so once you've defined what your brand promise is, it's, um, uh, it, it's important to know that uh, brands are never finished. This is something, it's, it's, it's like a river, not a pond. It's always moving. And, uh, and so you are looking at your brand promise uh, and making decisions through that lens. Uh, and so what we're seeing um, is that we, uh, a lot of organizations are revisiting that because our world has indeed changed. And um, with that change, expectations change. So, um, I mean, right now, uh, and, and I think the pro professor touched on it. I mean, I think it's everyone's role. It's man uh, everyone that's managing a brand today should be really good at listening and listening and then taking that insight and uh, looking at their brand promise. Does it matter in times like this? Uh, and if it doesn't, then it's, you need to take a look at it. Yeah, I would also say that this, this is also a really good time to assess some of your other intangible assets, like your people. Um, who, you know, who has value to your customers? Are there critical employees? Who, who have relationships with, with, with customers. When you, 
you, you really want to think twice about laying off those, those folks uh, because they, they are the lifeblood of your business. And yes, it may be difficult to get through um, you know, if, if revenue is down, but you know, a lot of what business is about is about relationships. And that's about the people that, that you employ and interact with on a daily basis. Great, so we, we do, thank you. So we do have one more question from Professor Choi. How long does it take for a startup to build a brand? Should startups focus on landing sales versus building a brand or no? Can they compete as objectives? You want, you want to take that, David? You want me to? I, I, I'll I start do. and then, then I'll, okay. I'll let you chime in because it, it's, it's your business. But uh, the, the, the simple answer to your question, and it's the academic answer, is it depends. Depends on the resources that you have. You can build a brand very quickly. So Facebook did not exist in 2006, um, and it it now has relationships with billions of people. Um, I mean, the, we we've seen brands built very quickly, but it does require resources. Um, Amazon has been very successful um, by most metrics, except that Amazon rarely reports a profit. Why? Because all the money that they make, they're putting back into the business to further build the brand. And so th there is a question of, of what resources do you have? That said, you can build a brand without enormous resources. You just have to get very clever about it. Uh, and there, there's a wonderful Harvard Business Review paper uh, on uh, building brands on, on a on a low budget uh, that I would recommend to you. And there are a number of examples. Uh, haagen is a really good example that basically built the brand by, by getting on restaurant menus um, and, uh, you know, and, and not just any restaurant, high-end premium restaurants. And um, you know, Swatch is another good example that has used a lot of, a lot of gimmicky promotions um, that, um, get attention uh, and don't use traditional media. So I, I do think you can build a brand with, with a, a small amount of money, um, but you have to be very clever and, and creative. Yeah, and I would uh, add to that um, more to the sales side of, of the question because that's, that's a big question that every entrepreneur has. Uh, how can I, I may have limited runway, I've, I need sales. So how can I build a brand without sales and what comes first? Well, keep in mind that every action you make is building an association uh, to your brand and it's encoding value or not in someone's mind. So you're actually building uh, uh, sales and brand. Brand is, is seen as something that, that you know, happens over time. Uh, and uh, sales are, you know, it's something that happens now. Usually you have organizations that are focused on the now, we need sales, uh, and brand is uh, a little bit further down uh, the line. Um, but the two really have to be, they have to come together and brands need to be built in parallel with sales and, and uh, the idea that you're building uh, this, uh, this value in someone's mind. Um, sure, the time it takes, it, there are a lot of variables. Um, but they, they're not, they shouldn't compete as objectives. Uh, they shouldn't be competitive, rather, uh, of each other. Um, you should be thinking about brand at the same time you're thinking about a business plan. Uh, at the embryonic stages, you should be thinking about what this, uh, the human side of your brand, what this value, is, that your brand is going to be the thing that connects to the people that matter most to your future. So if you're just thinking about the technology, or you're just thinking about the offering, uh, and you're not thinking about that that human side. Um, you're not going to build a business as fast as you want as you want to. So that's my my thoughts on that. Fantastic, thank you. I really appreciate everyone's time, and thank you to our wonderful speakers, Professor Stewart and Mr. Day. This was a really great talk, and and some valuable insights for our community. 
And so again, thank you everyone for joining. Um, please do join us next time for our next webinar with Lou Jaffe, um, the godfather of video conferencing, as he discusses how video conferencing has become a necessity in our lives and, and really part of our day to day. So again, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our guests and attendees. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar session. Have a great day, everyone.